I have 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started, if that's okay with everybody. Um, Karen, uh, Ms. Karen Yemo is uh, dialed in on uh, Google Meet, and Mr. Jay, I'm hoping, will pop in. He was teaching today, so hopefully he will be here just to remind everybody when and if he does uh, log in, he'll need to leave by 11. Um, so I, Sue Jones, will uh, go ahead and take coordinating running the meeting today. We'll start off with the uh, public comment. And I see that there are no names on the list, but I'll just make a call for any public comment. Okay, so we have no public comment. But thank you everybody for uh, being here today, October 12th, 2022, for our um, curriculum and instruction meeting. A meeting is being recorded um, for um, public viewing and, and staff viewing at any later date. Um, I'll start off with uh, approval of the minutes from the September 14th meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes, which are posted within board docs? No, ma'am. Okay. Hey, who are voting members of curriculum? <laughs> just, just you just and the me. three of us? Well, I'll yeah. second your motion uh, with no changes, <laughs> and uh, we'll let the meeting minutes stay in the brief as they are posted, as we did previously. Um, then next we have board member comments. Ms. Yoho? Not at this time. Ms. Yoho has no comments. I don't see Mr. J uh, logged in. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here on this beautiful day. Um, I know the, the subject matters that we have at hand today, um, one of which is particularly close to my heart being an instructor at FCC and actually being in, in, involved with our early college uh, programming uh, work that was started, I think it was about 15 years ago when we went up to the University of New Hampshire in Vermont, up that way somewhere, and start, started talking about how we can have high school students coming in and getting credits. Uh, so it's nice to see all of this uh, uh, come to fruition. And so uh, I look forward to uh, the good work that's going to happen today. Um, so without any further ado, um, on the uh, agenda, we have the dual enrollment updates with Diana Sun. Great, thank you. Um, so my name is Diana Sun. I'm the coordinator of dual enrollment, um, and I work uh, in curriculum. So we have currently four programs that fall under the umbrella term dual enrollment. Um, our largest program is the high school based program. That's where the students can take college classes in their high school, um, mostly taught by our uh, FCPS teachers who are qualified as college faculty. Uh, these courses are available at all comprehensive high schools as well as in the Career and Technology Center and in the blended virtual program. Um, and we do have courses that are specific to the Fine Arts Academy as well. Uh, these courses tend to focus on highly transferable general education offerings. Um, so the most common offering is English 101. Um, the second most common offering is Math 120, which is statistics. And those are, you know, generally the course offerings in the high school based program are the highly transferable, except the ones in those very specialized programs like CTC and the Fine Arts Academy. Um, our next largest program and the program that has been around the longest is um, Open Campus. Uh, we have approximately between 300 and 400 students every, every year who attend classes on FCC's campus um, and they're high school students. Sometimes they're earning both high school and college credit. Um, sometimes they're just earning college credit. Uh, FCC has recently hired an advisor who um, is dedicated to the Open Campus population. She has a few other duties as well, but um, that has been very helpful in supporting our students. We also have now an early college, um, and early college is our only selective admissions program for dual enrollment. Uh, the early college currently has 50 students enrolled, so we admit about 25 every year. Um, 15 graduated last spring of 2022, um, and the reason that number is a little lower is they started class, they started early college in fall of 2020. So if you can imagine being the first class of a program in that crazy semester that we had, um, we're very proud of them. Uh, the students come from all 10 of the comprehensive high schools. So we have representation from all of those different schools. Um, and they major in a variety of different programs um, at, at FCC. We don't have specific programs that they're required to do, which is a departure from other early college programs around the state. 
We also have career pathways where students are able to access the non-credit program offerings at FCC. Um, these are typically offered at FCC's Monroe Center, which is kind of similar to our Career Technology Center. Um, the largest partnership we have is a, a program with Frederick High School, um, where they take some of those certified nursing assess assistant or dental assistant classes actually in the high school before they then complete their non-credit um, credential at FCC's campus using FCC's instructors in their program. Um, however, we do have a handful of students from all over the county who access uh, a variety of programs there, everything from welding and HVAC to um, we've got, we had a kid who did home inspections and uh, we have a kid who's doing phlebotomy next spring. So um, we've got a lot of variety. In that one. So one of the things that we've been able to maintain as well as continue to grow is, um, is the dual enrollment program. Uh, a lot of programs around the state and around the country during the pandemic actually decreased. Um, and I, I did pull out some of our um, more recent data because this is the state data which lags a little bit. You can see that not only do we have um, a larger percentage of students participating than the average in Maryland, our rate of growth is also typically faster than the average rate of growth in Maryland. Um, we have a, a dual enrollment program that is looked to by other counties in the state of Maryland as a leader and very innovative in providing um, great opportunities for students. Um, and as we move into Blueprint, I think that FCPS will continue to be a leader in the state. Um, our preliminary school year 23 data, and I'll talk about that in a minute, does show additional growth. We kind of leveled off during COVID, but we are back up to um, that same rate of growth that we were having in the lead up to COVID. Um, the average number of college credits taken has doubled in the last five years. Um, and so last school year, you know, the number of students has increased as well as they're now um, taking an average of more than two college courses. So 7.9 college credits it, um, and a typical college course is three or four credits. Um, we also have 278 co college courses running in the high schools this school year. Um, between fall and spring semester, about 90 FCPS teachers are serving <laughs> as FCC college adjuncts. So this program is pretty massive um, in a lot of different ways. So Diana, just to clarify that, 278 college courses, you're talking multiple sections of English 101, yes. multiple sections of mathematics, not 278 distinct courses. No, right? sections. Yes, yes, sections. sections. Okay. So, and it would include um, the CTC sections and the Fine Arts Academy, anything that's running in our high school buildings. There are a handful of those um, that are taught by FCC provided adjuncts. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that when I'm talking about equity. So I did pull our preliminary numbers for school year 23. So this is um, the school year 23, which is the purple line is unverified, but it is out of our system and it, it represents current enrollments. We've been tracking since I came into this position in 2018, and that's the blue line. Um, the fact that we have had some uh, disparities and some lack of uh, <coughs> equity in our dual enrollment programs, particular, particularly among these student groups. Um, and so one of the things that we've been trying to put forward are a number of, of pieces of this programming that are focused on ac equity and access. Um, so you can see that we, um, overall, seniors who participated in dual enrollment, the graduating class last year had a little bit of a lower percentage than um, we typically have, but we're now back up to um, current seniors are enrolled to have at least 55% of them um, graduate with some kind of dual enrollment experience before they leave us. Uh, we still do have some disparities in different student groups, but you can see that our purposeful sort of focus on equity is starting to close some of those gaps. So, for example, in last school year senior class, a higher percentage of black and Hispanic um, seniors did graduate with dual, dual enrollment experience compared to the year before, even though overall as a county, we had fewer seniors um, with that experience. So some of the things we're doing with equity and access, we've been really look, focused on um, expanding and having different offerings in the high schools. Um, not every high school is able to offer the same course offerings. And so 
um, we've been really looking at each high school and, and how can we get a comparable set of offerings at those high schools is the high school based program really does um, eliminate that barrier of transportation for students. Um, we've also been focused on partnering with FCC to look at FCC and FCPS local placement measures for students able to take courses, um, college courses. Right now, um, there is a statewide MOU that allows students to take um, a variety of college courses, but we as a partnership, FCC and FCPS work together um, to look at some additional measures, including course grades and, um, and things like that for our students. That has, that's been one of the main ways in which our students have been allowed to continue to take these classes even during COVID when they couldn't take tests. Um, our online high school based course offerings, we've started to have a few of those. Um, so, for example, we have a Calculus 3 class that any student in the county can access through the, the virtual program. Um, and we're also having an early childhood class that will be um, running that any student in the county can offer. It'll be running in what FCC calls the structured remote format, um, which means that it's a synchronous class. So we also have um, started to pilot some blended developmental and credit bearing courses. These are courses where students may not meet the college readiness measures directly. Um, the one that we piloted last year was ESOL 100, which is a targeted class for English learners. Um, it is uh, three academic credits that are transferable and three that would be considered developmental. And the students, if they finish that course, they are then eligible to enroll in any class that has an English readiness um, measure and we had quite a few students take that course and then go on to take some additional courses. Um, we're also looking at piloting one math course that is similar to that, a Math 101A at Tuscarora High School this spring. Um, and again, it will be students who maybe are not quite at that math readiness measure, but they would receive then that um, supported coursework to be able to earn college credit that is transferable as well as be able to get the, their supported needs met with. Um, we've also expanded, um, FCC has been doing their own equity work and it's been really powerful. Um, and one of the things they wanted to do is they have been supporting our high school based programs with adjuncts in, especially in um, school buildings where there was, a, a, it was more difficult to offer some of the classes that we would like. So we have a couple of adjuncts teaching up at Catoctin High School where, you know, getting down to FCC's campus is really difficult. And then we have a handful teaching. Uh, we had one teach at Frederick High last year. We had one teach at um, Thomas Johnson High School last year, or Thomas Johnson High School this year, Tuscarora last year and this year. And then we have a couple at um, Walkersville High School as well to support some of the offerings there. Um, so that's been a really great partnership. Yeah, Diana, if you could, if you go back to the second bullet on the slide about the local placement measures, could you share with the board a little bit of the good work that we did with the English department at FCC during COVID as a temporary uh, placement measure and what the status of that is? Absolutely. Um, I mean, that was a very difficult time. If you guys remember spring of 2020, everything was shut down and we weren't even able to offer tests which were the primary placement measure so there's acuplacer testing that fcc runs but sats were shut down um, students couldn't take their mcap which is how they primarily had qualified previously they couldn't take a whole bunch of other um, testing options and so we got together with um, the english department as well as you know the testing uh testing office over at fcc as well as the testing office in fcps it was a it was a big effort we have had for a long time um, math course grades as placement options. So if a student has a B or higher in an algebra two course or higher, they are considered ready in math. Um, and that's because of the strength of our partnership between our math department at FCPS and our math department at FCC. They have vetted our curriculum and looked at it and said, you know, students are achieving at that level, they're ready for college courses and we've had great success data outcomes with that. So during this time, the English department reviewed the curriculum of English 10 and decided that they were going to, as a temporary measure, offer that, um, that same opportunity for the English 10 course of B or higher in English 10 
um, would allow a student to place directly into English 101 or another FCP, FCC course that required that English college placement. Um, and we studied the measure in that, that year that followed and the rate of success was very similar to the rate for all other college placement measures. So it actually, as a measure, got extended temporarily for another school year um, and even expanded to include English 11 um, and, and the English 10-11 blended course. Um, and then the data continued to be good for that. Um, you know, we typically have dual enrollment students uh, are typically 85 to 90 percent successful in English 101. The students who use that measure, it varied a little bit, but it was around 87 percent success rate. So it's very similar to the other college uh, college of access measures we use. So it is actually still in place for this year as we continue to get data um, and shift over to a different CCR measure under blue. Well, I think from an equity and access perspective, what we don't know in that data, and we would never is how many students actually accessed English under this grade-based approach rather than an active placer assessment. So if we, you know, we know many colleges, for instance, have gone to SAT optional to allow broader access into the college <laughs> uh, environment. And uh, we just felt that this was something that you as board members would need to be aware of because this is a real big uh, highlight from something that I think we learned that uh, from the pandemic itself. So this this top change probably would not have occurred had we been absent that testing in the spring. Uh, and so this is important for, for us to know. Right. Thank you, Diane. Um, yes, uh, I did mention the English Learners High School based courses. We are also exploring um, world language. We have our first world language dual enrollment course running at Brunswick High School this, this fall. It's Latin. Um, we're looking at visual and performing arts um, classes in the comprehensive high schools, not just in the fine arts academy. Um, we also have some additional um, programs at CTC that are looking at dual enrollment offerings. So we always are continuing to look at our high school based courses and expand those offerings if there is a need and interest for students. Um, we've also, through the ESSER Fund Grant, um, been able to run an early, create this early foundations program where 10th um, grade students are um, given some career coaching from FCC and then brought to FCC's campus so that they can understand what programs are available to them and what is um, accessible to them as after they graduate, but as well as dual enrollment opportunities. One of the reasons for that being under ESSER is that, you know, a lot of those students were not in their buildings ninth grade year to get access to all of that uh, counseling information about post-secondary opportunities. Um, so last year we had 141 10th grade students from all over the county visit and we're gearing up to um, have, a few, have a few more visits this November and December. Um, it's been a very powerful program. Our counselors have anecdotally reported that they're seeing a lot of students that um, you know, hadn't considered these things before, start to consider taking an early um, dual enrollment class or going over to the Monroe Center or doing CTC and accessing dual enrollment that way. Um, and it's been pretty powerful. And that is a targeted program. So I'm going to shift over to Maryland Blueprint. So um, dual enrollment has in Maryland fallen under the CCR CCA Act of 2013. Um, but Maryland Blueprint for uh, the Blueprint for Maryland's Future has a lot of laws about dual enrollment in it, and it is intended to replace um, many of the provisions in the CCR CCA Act of 2013. And so um, we've got a lot coming <laughs> with what where we need to go for dual enrollment. Um, one of the biggest things that we're looking at right now, and it, it you know, with budgeting season and things like that, is that the post-CCR pathways, which includes dual enrollment, um, the language in, in Maryland Blueprint is that it has to be offered at no cost to students. Um, we also, with the high school-based program, obviously we haven't maxed out our need. There are still some college, some high schools that are only able to offer a particular class to seniors because they have more students who want to take the course that then can, then they have instructors to teach it. Um, and so we, we continue to have a need for our high school based instructors to become credentialed as, as adjuncts. Um, we also currently only have staffing between FCC um, advisors and, 
and the support on FCPS side for 25 students per class for early college. We are anticipating that the number of applicants will go up significantly this year. Um, last year, we did have to turn away quite a few students who were very well qualified for the program. Um, we're also looking to expand in the early college model that's been very successful a supported full-time senior year program at FCC. Um, but again, you know, there's there's a, a partnership and, and everything that we need to be looking ahead for what would students need when they got to campus. Well, Diana, that that the model of the early college and certainly the senior year version, which is basically half of early college, is pretty time intensive for staff who are involved with that. I think the uh, the, the advising model we use is high support and uh, requires a lot of contact time with students and it's certainly been successful, but it's not something that can kind of run on its own. It, it, it has to have very active involvement from both FCC and FCPS staff. Yes, and especially when we um, do it with a lens towards equity, um, you know, if we're if we're inviting and supporting students with higher needs, we need to be able to meet those needs with our support. Um, so also we're working on state advocacy, um, you know, as the state is making implementation of blueprint, um, FCPS is a leader in the dual enrollment area. Um, you know, we're making an effort to be present in those meetings to make sure that we um, are sharing communication and being aware of what the state is. In the past, um, the state has had very limited oversight of dual enrollment. Um, beyond reporting, there was almost no programming recommendations that the state did. But under Blueprint, there's a lot of programming recommendations that we're making. Um, we also are continuing our collaboration with institutes of higher education, especially FCC, which is our primary partner. Um, we're also in the process this year, we need to revise and renew our memorandum of understanding with FCC. Partly that's in line with the, the new requirements of Blueprint, but also it's the year that we should be doing that anyway. So it's a good year to do that. And so that's kind of a dual enrollment in a nutshell in Frederick County. Um, and I will open it up to questions. Mr. J has joined the meeting. So um, I, I don't know, Mr. J, if you caught all that presentation and I'll start with you if you have any comments. So I'll thank you so much. I'll be able to get to the presentation. Um, sorry for my delay. Had some difficult, uh, and you'll have to speak up, Mr. Um, J. Sorry. Uh, so can you hear me now? How's that? Just as high as I can go. Use so, your classroom uh, voice. <laughs> I'll be brief. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to supporting the uh, early college program with dual enrollment in Frederick County. I think it's a great program, and I, I agree with the public that we should. Um, be mindful that um, it needs to be hands on, so we have to grow it slow. We don't want to grow it fast and, and it has become fragile. So, we want to have a, a quality program. So, I'm looking forward to the support, but I don't want to rush it too fast to where we be expanded and it doesn't stand up to the last. So, it could be a lasting program. So, I support his comments about uh, making sure it's staff intensive, but we're appropriately staffed and they're appropriately paid. I have one question um, for the mentioned the need of. Uh, adjunct teachers for SCPS. Um, what is the uh, incentive for them, if any? That's a great question. Um, so, the way that you become an adjunct for FCC, um, you have to have a master's degree, typically in the content that you would be teaching, or at least 15 to 18 um, graduate credit hours in the content to be taught. Now, that varies a little bit by course. Um, so typically teachers have been motivated if they um, want to move up on the, uh, the the pay scale for FCPS, because if you get more graduate credits, you get um, higher on the pay scale. And they have been motivated by potentially the professional learning. Um, you know, some teachers just really want to teach those classes. So it has not been a specific incentive for dual enrollment teachers to become adjunct um, professors. So we have run into some challenges there um, as we're trying to convince people to go through this process. Are there any ideas to, to change that or add some, some sugar, to, sugar to that? 
I'm investigating Title II funding at this time, but beyond that, not. Yeah, there's nothing on the, if, Mr. Jay, if you're asking about additional compensation, there's nothing on the horizon in conversations about that. I mean, it could be certification, it could be uh, credits towards uh, national board. Just, we can get creative, but as long as we're thinking about, like, you know, that is extra work and extra, extra process, and we can reward that some way, that's, that's a good thing to be thinking about. So I'm, I'm glad we're thinking in that direction. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jay. Ms. Yarrow? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Boy, this doesn't fit my style of learning at all. And I have a big screen that's popped up in mine. I'm going to be switching devices between presentations. Uh, and I took a lot of notes. So I can only imagine if I had been there how much more I would have gotten. Um, out of this. Um, wow. I don't think I have any questions. Sorry, there was so much information. It is great, great stuff, and I love to hear about it. Um, I don't think I have any other questions or any questions at this point in time. Thank you. Um, well, I'm fortunate in that I get to be on the other side of these conversations at the uh, Frederick Community College. I do know. Um, from both aspects, you know, we want to keep the program growing. And right now I actually have four early college students in my face-to-face -face programming class. Um, I know it's real important that those students succeed because if they if they start failing our courses at FCC, it jeopardizes their ability to graduate from high school. And I actually had an encounter with that during COVID when everything was remote, where a student um, of mine who was early college was failing class and, and there's significant consequences um, for that student. And so um, I'm really, really pleased about the great relationship that's already in place. Um, and that, uh, as uh, Dr. Cuppet mentioned, I, I also know there it is very time intensive. I mean, just hearing hallway conversations about trying to find adjuncts to be able to go out to the high schools and, you know, hear, hearing like just the effort that's involved. Um, and I know it's tremendous effort on both sides. Um, that it, it's uh, it's work that we need to continue to frame so that it remains successful. I, I, I'm under this impression, at least from the, the FCC, and that this is like a money loser for us. Um, and so I don't know what's happening in the MOU, but um, uh, I hope that whatever gets resolved, it can be like a win-win for everybody, especially our students, um, but also the fact that we can contain, you know, continue to run I mean, it's, it is kind of a business, you know, to build it. We have to all pay people to, to do their jobs. And so I know that there's a, a good effort on everybody's part um, for that. So, uh, and I can just attest to the early college students I have right now. They're excellent. I, I get them identified early so that I can, I know who they are and make sure that they're never going to fall one inch behind in their work. Um, it's just uh, like critically important in that respect. So. Um, I would like to just ask on the links, is links the program involved with the work with the CNA and then assistant, or is it just like through Frederick High School? So it um, started with links because they have a little more flexibility in providing transportation to the Monroe Center, but it's a model that um, runs through their regular school day program. And so it could potentially be scalable and move with some other high schools. Mm -hmm. um, we just would have a bigger struggle with transportation since there's fewer transportation options from. I don't who and I don't know who's involved with developing the MOU, but is anybody like thinking big or bigger, like getting like a new facility or a building um, to house programs so that we can grow? Because I know FCC just got another three hundred fifty thousand dollar grant to develop cell and gene therapy programs. And I, I would love to see like this career pipeline be accessible to students at you know, younger ages. And that's just like what's happened this week. You know, like, are we thinking about, I don't know, you get Monroe, we get CTC, Terry now build new building. Like who's looking at the long-term strategic plan? Because uh, so, I know Congressman Tro uh -huh. has brought that up a couple of times when I've had uh, opportunities to speak with him. Yeah, so, so to my knowledge, there are plenty of other FCPS folks here. Um, we've never really kind of committed to something as far as a capital <clears throat> associated with an MOU with an organization. 
And the MOU work that we're doing predominantly lives in the operating budget. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, our capital budget is handled very differently. But um, I do know that the um, space related challenges that we're having, and we're not only having them in our career technical areas, but we're also having them finding pre K locations. So uh, there's a number of space challenges that we're currently looking at, but I doubt that any of those would be less than an MOU. Well, but from a strategic perspective, do we have, like, what do we have in terms of like a five year plan for where we're going to be at? Do we have that or is it just, okay. And where does that for sit? The moment, yeah. yeah, for the whole, the whole umbrella, like yeah, the dual enrollment, I'm concerned dual enrollment separate from early college, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. separate from open campus and right. almost separate from transfer programs and career programs. Because I still think there's a lot of work that we can do career program wise in, in other areas of, of so I would say that the blueprint implementation plan is something that we'll be working on and mm -hmm. certainly the dual enrollment component is part of that as well as the other pillars in the blueprint so yeah. that's we'll be required to submit that in March mm -hmm. so and, and it'll be a multi-year plan so I think we'll be really looking at that as we look at all the components within the blueprint and really determining where is it we need to go for the student pathways mm -hmm. like Diana talked about um, when we really are into those details. Mm -hmm. Yes, most of the five-year dual enrollment strategic plan is associated with blueprint, uh, blueprint work. But um, that said, I have. But <laughs> well, well, on the show, the, I think the so, for instance, FCPS being open to having a conversation with FCC about use of their physical space to, you know, bridge a, a program that we don't have that we could funnel up to you. Certainly, we would have those conversations. I don't know. Like the use of existing space is very different than a capital improvement. That's what, that's the only distinction I'm trying to make. So mm -hmm. uh, we I've had past conversations with um, upper uh, leadership at FCC around the use of the Monroe Center. Uh, what we are in, in the area where that we probably have the biggest space needs because oftentimes it needs to be very specialized is in the career technical um, mm -hmm. area. Offering an English 101 is a lot easier from a capital perspective. So right now. We're working with our career tech center to look at uh, a dental program that we're going to apply for through the innovation grant. And we have some equipment, but it's requiring um, kind of a retooling at our CTC right now. And so, you know, adding existing programs and being able to use existing uh, square footage somewhere, mm -hmm. and we're open to that. We're actually starting to have a lot of conversations with that when it comes to pre-K, because the, uh, no elementary school that we have in our district was created with the blueprint pre-K vision in mind. Mm -hmm. And so now we'll, we'll do that moving forward, but how do we go back and um, respond to our existing facilities? That's a challenge that we're having. We're trying to get as creative as we can, and we'll continue to have those conversations. So if FCC wants to engage in some existing new space conversations, that, that could very well be part of it. Mm -hmm. and, and just as, not an aside, but it was something I wasn't aware of until this week was the extent of which FCPS uses classroom space at the public safety training facility, which is out with uh, Chief Coe and Dr. Dyson, and we were actually doing SCPS training being run when they right. created out there. I didn't realize that during the day that there was uh, that amount of collaboration yeah. there, and I know that that is a substantial amount of classroom space uh, that, that, that they do have there. So, uh, you know, I just... I love the great work, but I'm never going to be satisfied with where we're at, as I'm sure you're not, and nobody here is. It's like, how can we continue to serve our students? So, um, uh, so thank you, and it's great to know, uh, Ms. Freeman, that you said that, the, that we're already like on board with knowing what the blueprint has and, and the plan, um, but knowing, um, so what you said about we're driving, FCPS is driving a lot of the innovation in that area, we well, let's continue to just like tell the state, look, we're going to do, and rather than letting them tell us. So. I think we can influence okay. You're right. <laughs> we, we are not a shy district when it comes to speaking up. Okay. So thank you. It was all great work. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. It's been a great day. If you want to pass the mouse in. So I want to welcome our um, social studies team here today. Um, I'll let them each introduce themselves, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to thank them for bringing uh, one of the regular updates in curriculum that we do. Um, and so I'll turn it over to who will go first. Kim? I'll go first. Okay. And then we'll be second to. 
the only other food up over there you got. I'll try. I can't see where it says. Bottom right. Go over there. Bottom right. Oh, okay. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right here. Oh, my God. I can't see. I know. I got to give you the assist there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is this a PowerPoint? I'm going to use this PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, hi, I'm Kim Day. I'm the Elementary Social Studies Curriculum Specialist. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a broad overview of the work that's being done to support elementary social studies instruction in our school. So, to begin, I wanted to back up all the way back to uh, June of 2020 when Maryland State Department of Education um, revised the elementary social studies framework. And as a result, in March of 2022, well, I put forward revisions to our FCPS essential curriculum, and that was approved uh, this past March. So since then, we've been working on several items in order to implement the revised essential curriculum. One of the first things we did was to conduct a uh, textbook review in order to approve a new supplementary text for grades four and five that better aligned with the <coughs> new essential curriculum. This approval was finalized in May of uh, 2022, and we are now in the process of purchasing those texts for all the classrooms and the schools, and the teachers will start using those in January of 2023. <coughs> The bulk of our work is in curriculum writing, and so this past summer, uh, we held curriculum writing workshops in which we hire teachers to help us to curate resources and, and develop curriculum. We did that in grades kindergarten and grades four and five this year. This work is always ongoing, and the units of study are, going, are actually starting to be implemented in kindergarten right now, and grades four and five, like I said, will start in quarter grade. In kindergarten, the social studies units are based in very traditional social studies topics, including civics, geography, um, economics, and history. And in grades four and five, students will study turning points in American history with Maryland history embedded within that. Um, but they also learn civics, geography, economics, and history, but just through a historical lens. Uh, in all grades, students learn and develop social studies skills and practices, such as asking and answering compelling questions, gathering and evaluating evidence, examining multiple perspectives, making claims, and constructing arguments using evidence. <coughs> in addition, English language arts skills of reading, writing, and speaking and listening are the foundation of each social studies lesson. To support teachers and reduce the amount of planning time for an elementary school teacher, uh, we like to provide as many resources as we can to, uh, to help them plan their social studies instruction. The curriculum resources are all available to teachers on both Schoology and Curriculum Now. Each unit has teacher, a, a teacher planning tool that we call an at a glance, which gives the teacher everything they need in just one document, they can get to it from that one document called the at a glance. And um, some of the things that we may have are both student facing and teacher, teacher resources such as vocabulary lists, word wall cards, interactive notebook vocabulary sheets, um, assessments and assignments that are aligned to each of the standards, instructional slideshows, and those can be used for both student and teacher use. The curation of these curriculum resources should help teachers to plan and implement social studies lessons very easily. To continue the work in transitioning over to the updated essential curriculum, this next coming summer, we will um, hire teachers in grades one, two, and three, and then those uh, new resources and new units of study will be implemented in the next school year 23-24. There will be a continued focus on literacy and learning and developing social studies skills and practices.
we always continue to strive to provide curriculum resources that are founded in best um, pedagogical practices. The elementary social studies resources are lent through diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging practices, mind brain education strategies, and emerging science principles of, in, of, of instruction. In addition to the in classroom uh, support that we provide, we're also committed to supporting our schools to provide social studies extracurricular activities. So I'm excited that the elementary social studies fair will again be taking a place in conjunction with the science fair on March 25th at Tuscarora High School. <coughs> and I'm really pleased to say that there's a new FCTA contracted stipend for teachers to run a history club in elementary schools this year if they choose, because these kinds of opportunities for students are valuable learning experiences that really inspire, teach inspire both teachers actually, because they get to interact with kids in a different way, but they inspire students um, to actually follow passion. So I really hope that many students are able to take advantage of these, um, these extracurricular activities that are going on in the schools regarding social studies. Do you want to open the questions before we move to secondary? Uh, sure. Um, Mr. Jay? Uh, thank you. Just want to say hi, Kim. Hello, Mr. Jay. Nice to see you virtually. Me too. Good to hear you. Um, so I, I, I love that we're giving teachers like this for history, so it's wonderful. I love what they were uh, providing teachers uh, with support for uh, recent planning time and uh, other school. It's wonderful as well. Um, just out of curiosity, with the, um, the return of the um, fair with this, for history, which is really cool, are there any, um, can I say this, um, any international or national uh, content that are you get involved with? So, um, you know, there's a National History Day that's uh, traditionally always been for middle school. They, um, that organization is now starting a, to develop a National History Day type competition for elementary school. So that's something that's in its infancy stages, but definitely something that we will be promoting and uh, I'll start learning more about so that I can help support teachers with that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Michelle? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I had to switch devices. I'm getting messages. Okay. Um, so, yes, everything Mr. J just said, that's all really good stuff. Um, I know, you know, teachers in elementary never wanted to change grades in part because they'd already built their science and social studies, and especially social studies, because it was on us to. You know, we're talking 20 years ago to get all of our own resources. I mean, you just build up so much and you're like, no, don't make me change grades. I'll have to start from scratch with the uh, especially social studies resources. So that that is definitely a good move and uh, I'm sure appreciated. And just the less, you know, lessening of the planning time involved uh, has to be appreciated. Um, so always, and I'll also throw this to Ms. Bernard, um, she can keep it in mind and answer it at the end. Um, you know, people always talk about, we don't teach civics anymore. And, you know, I think if you ask the teachers, especially fifth grade and then um, secondary, they'd say, but we do, you know, and sometimes the students don't get it. So if you could, eat, you know, address, and then Ms. Bernard, after her time, just address how we are teaching civics so that our students grow up to be good citizens. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. So, um, yeah, there's a civic standard. I mean, that's the state standard, it's, a, it's civics. And so we have many, many um, objectives that are revolve around civics. And in grades K through three, there is entire units that are civics found based, right? So. In kindergarten, it really starts about learning about rules and people of in really kindergarten and first grade. It really talks about rules and why we have them and um, why and and people in authority and people are making those types of rules and um, even really talking a little bit about what equity means and equality means and those sorts of things are starting to be developed in our civics units as well. 
And then we also talk a lot about how to be a good citizen in your classroom, in your community. And we're, we're asking our kids to practice those things, even starting in kindergarten, because actually we do a lot in kindergarten to build those civics concepts of how do you be a good citizen in your classroom? How are you a good citizen at home? How are you a good citizen in the community? And a lot of times those things are like picking up after yourself, you know, um, following the rules, uh, helping out other people, not littering when you're outside, those sorts of things. And so we really want to make sure uh, that we're building that, that great foundation so that when we get start to move into the upper grades, then we can start talking a little bit about the uh, foundation of American government. And so that really moves in, we move towards that in grades three, four, and five. I think the biggest thing that we have to keep in mind, and this is maybe why somebody from the general public doesn't recognize civics as civics, is that it's has to be developmentally appropriate, right? So what a yeah. kindergartner or first grader is going to grasp when it comes to civics is going to be very different than a fifth grader, an eighth grader, or a senior in one grade. And so um, I do think there's a lot of attention that the curriculum team here um, gives to seeing that standards that move from our elementary to middle to high school are dealt with on a developmentally appropriate way. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for, for all the good work and um, again, I, I just think that uh, you can see the effort, the continuous effort that's being uh, put forth to uh, ensure we have high quality curriculum. Thank you. Okay. You can pass the mouse down while I'm calling James. Sure, James and Juan can introduce himself. We'll move on to second. I'm Colleen Bernard, and I'm the curriculum specialist for secondary social studies. And with me today is James Hines. I am the teacher specialist for secondary social studies. So we're going to go ahead and roll into the secondary social studies updates. Um, at the state level, we have, uh, of course, six required courses in the core program in secondary. Uh, the state has reformulated four of those six and is currently working on the last two, which is our sixth and seventh grade program. Um, at this point, <clears throat> The state has uh, developed new standards for sixth and seventh grade, but they are preliminary. They're not um, they're not out in the public domain yet. They've provided them to supervisors for review. We've provided feedback, and they are still in the deliberative um, process of, of for formalizing those standards. At this point, we're expecting those standards from the state in the spring of 2023. Um, <clears throat> but we have also had our content meetings canceled. So there's been no updates that in regards to this. So this is um, the earliest that we would see and implement those standards. With spring 2020, we would, if we get them in the spring of 2023, we would work on them in summer workshops, uh, summer 2023 through the following school year, bring them to the board for approval spring of 2024, um, take another year to curate the appropriate resources um, and develop the program with rollout in fall of 2020. Um, so that's where we are with sixth and seventh grade. It looks like at this point, the state has decided to take a geographic approach to sixth and seventh grade and combine world history content through a geography lens. Um, so it will retain a lot of the content we currently teach in sixth and seventh, it'll just be lensed differently for geography. Um, and we have a resource in place. Uh, we'll have to look at you know appropriateness of the resource that we currently have in place when we get there. Um, so that is sixth and seventh grade. Like I said, all the other core courses have been updated at this point. They've tweaked um, government uh, just a bit, but overall, uh, nothing substantive has changed uh, with that course. Um, we are continuing to curate high quality content. Uh, we untethered from textbooks where we could so that we could broaden the historical narrative and bring in um, the, a broader picture of um, the historical context for our courses and provide more um, creative space for the construction of our courses. And that is built out through our blueprint courses in the school as well. Uh, during the COVID years, we created um, what we refer to as footprints. 
um, of our curriculum for our teachers to use and we created those virtual resources. Uh, this past summer, we sunset those resources um, and replace them with more robust resources for each core course in the social sites. Um, not all the core courses are completely built out. We're going to continue that work through um, this year and into next summer, um, but we have limited time, limited resource, human resources um, in order to do that. So yeah, can I add to that too? Yeah, okay. Okay. And this, this was certainly something that <clears throat> could have been added just as easily in Kim's presentation is that one of the things that we've noticed since our COVID experience is that it's a little more difficult to get a hold of teachers to be curriculum right. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. I think just uh, workload on teachers might be part of it. We've had a significant number of per diem um, opportunities through our summer programming. And so pretty much across the board in our department, we've not gotten a number of teachers, uh, teachers to come in and be writers uh, over the summer. So that curriculum development tends to be slower than what it's been in the past. So I, I think it's important for the board to understand. Thank you for adding. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, but we've really been very intentional about attending to um, ensuring that our online resources are 508 compliant, that um, which provides that accessibility for online accessibility for our students, that we keep in mind um, social emotional learning integrated as part of those resources, mind brain education strategies like retrieval grids and um, interleaving of content, and then of course our disciplinary literacy in the social studies embedded and integrated throughout the entire uh, program. We've received a lot of positive feedback from our teachers, teachers that are using um, using our resources, um, continuing to make them more robust, um, and sharing their work with us as well, and sharing their feedback pretty consistently. <coughs> so state assessments. Um, Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, MCAP in government, uh, and this is where I will also address the civics question from Ms. Yoko. Um, we still have a, and we have had since well, the early 2000s, an assessment in government um, and civics in the state of Maryland. And Maryland is one of the few states that actually ranks high in civic education because we actually re required at one point um, the civics, the government test for high school graduation. It's still, um, a, it's still a requirement. Uh, as you know, the state voted in May of 2021 to change that test to an end of course exam. Uh, we are still waiting for more information to come from the state. We haven't heard anything recently. Um, they're still working on um, scoring, logistics, and turnaround time scores. At this point, um, it is a mandated assessment. Students must sit for the assessment, um, but this year it will not be part of the 20 percent um, of the course grade. <clears throat> That's all I know about where that is right now. And I'm seeing Ms. Bigman yep. shaking her head. We're all the same boat. Yeah. We're all the same boat. Um, so it's been more than five years since we implemented our benchmark assessments. And those benchmark assess assessments were originally implemented before we had the, the eighth grade assessment. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over the eighth grade assessment. Let me back up and talk about eighth grade assessment. Eighth grade assessment did have finally, <coughs> finally field tested in May of 2022, uh, we will not get any data from that test. Uh, we might see some preliminary kind of cohort data. The first data that we would be looking at would be from uh, May of 2023. It will not be, it will not be school system data or individual student data. Um, that is going to be a number of years down the road before we start getting that, that granular level of data. Uh, but the test is, um, is now in implementation. Then going to the local assessments. Um, since we now know where the state has landed on the revised government HSA and the eighth grade um, assessment with the use of evidence based argument sets, which are similar to document based questions, we um, pulled together a voluntary group of teachers this past spring and said, let's take a look at our benchmark program. What do we need it to do? Is it doing that? And then if not, how do we make it do what we need it to do? So we had a, a full revision of our benchmark, um, our benchmarks. And what we heard from teachers, uh, especially coming out of COVID, that the two um, document-based question um, pre-post tests 
that we had in place just were not um, not helpful for instructional purposes, right? So we have, you know, we're just sending kids down to do the, the documents and write their essays. And what they really wanted was scaffolding. And so that's what we created. We created a series of scaffolding tasks embedded throughout course instruction that are just part of um, traditional course um, instruction uh, that culminate in the, an evidence-based argument set. All of this paralleling the new state assessments and the format of those, uh, those assessments. And also providing data for our teachers to use in their SLOs and to use as part of the ALP process. So our goal was really to create a tool for instruction um, and a tool for gathering data to inform that instruction. Um, and of course, all along with our disciplinary goals. So we are we are re-rolling out benchmarks this year. Um, we're getting we're listening to the feedback from teachers, and we'll be tweaking those benchmarks. Thank you. All right. Um, course revisions and uh, elective courses. So. We are in the process of looking at all of our elective courses. Um, now that we've gotten most of our core courses where we need them to be, it's time for us to really um, go through all of our elective courses and refresh the standards for them. So we started with national enrollment issues. Um, we've revised those standards. We had a work group this past summer that worked on those standards. We finalized those in house in the office and really made a heavy focus on media literacy. Um, for these revised standards, and they're um, they're in the the um, document for your um, perusal and approval. Uh, you'll see them there. I'm trying to manipulate my laptop with the, the other mouse. Sorry. Um, so you'll see them there, um, starting with Unit One, Civic Participation, on through to Unit Six, Environmental Issues. Right. So it still um, somewhat parallels the current course that we have. Um, in place, and these standards will replace those standards next fall. So we're asking for approval of those standards. We're also asking for the approval of the creation of a 0.5 national and global course with the, for a couple of reasons. One, we only have um, three required courses in the social studies of high school. And very often getting to contemporary issues is pretty tough. Um, it's, it's tough getting through all of the history to get to the present day. And so providing more opportunities for students to access content about what's going on today in, in their lives, in our country, in the world, um, we wanted to provide more opportunities. The other thing is, is in the junior year, with the new point five health credit, we also wanted to provide some, flex, some additional flexibility for students to schedule um, other courses to marry with that. So, um, we're asking for the creation of this point five course, which would cover the first three uh, units of the um, 1.0 course. So that is there for your review as well. And then, I don't know, do you want to just wait for questions at the end or take them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. The Black and African American Studies course. So um, we have equity of access across the county. So if we have a school that wasn't able to run the course, um, we are able to provide access through the virtual schools. We have a virtual school section that's going to run in the spring. Um, going into next year, I just talked to Mike Watson, we're looking at offering that course virtually in um, the summer, fall, and in the spring. So year-round, a section of that course will be offered through virtual schools so that there is that equitable access, which is especially in our high schools that are small. Um, it's often tough. You have to make those decisions of what to run. And if you only have four or five students that have signed up for a course, those are, those are the tough decisions that principals have to make. And we want those students to be able to access this important content. Um, so we're providing that access through virtual school. Um, all of the high school, we have eight instructors of the course across 10 schools. And um, all of them are participating in the continued course development. And continue professional development for the course. They're very excited about the course um, and we're hearing very good feedback from it. Overall, our current course enrollment um, for the entire year as of 919 was 167. To give you some context, our most popular um, elective courses, psychology, that course enrollment is 534 this year, and national global, which we just talked about, that course enrollment across the district is 97. 
So this is a pretty healthy course enrollment uh, for the first run of an elective course in high school. And as we know, elective courses are very often uh, run based on a student interest, often who is teaching the course. Um, and so we've really um, spent a lot of time developing um, the content efficacy and pedagogical efficacy of the teachers of this course to deliver this content with fidelity. The Women's History and Studies um, course that was part of the ESSER grant money, uh, that course is in progress. We, uh, we have a small team of teachers working on that this summer. We're going to continue to work on that through um, this school year into next summer, and it'll be another year before uh, we bring those standards to the board for approval. Extracurricular programs, um, and this is where my social studies part is so incredibly happy right now. We're seeing a huge uptick in participation in our extracurricular programs. Our Civics and Law Academy that we do in conjunction with the Brother Bar Association in partnership with them um, is back this year. We haven't had a Civics and Law Academy since 2019. In the past, um, and I've been involved with it ever since 2010 at, at its inception, we've always kind of had to to really encourage participation. Um, and we usually got around 75 to 80 students to participate. We are currently registered at 146. Um, our capacity is 160. Uh, that is fantastic news. We might, not fantastic, we might have to wait with some kids, uh, but we're not gonna turn anyone away. We're gonna, we're gonna try to get them in, and that is at Frederick High School on Saturday, <clears throat> November 12th. Um, <clears throat> A big thanks to the Frederick Bar Association for uh, partnering up with us and especially um, Judge Terry Adams. So, in partnership, oh, let's see, uh, Frederick County Association of Student Councils. So, we've had two general assemblies one for middle school, the other for high school. Uh, the high, or I'm sorry, the other for all schools. Uh, the last general assembly was last week. 21 of 23 of our schools participated. We have not had that level of participation even before COVID. Um, so that is super exciting with 155 student leaders um, participating in that day. Um, in December, we look forward to our general assembly where our student member of the board candidates will provide their campaign speeches um, and have a chance to interact with our general assembly there. The Maryland General Assembly PAGE program will be back in person this year. It had been virtual for a couple of years through COVID. Um, so this is the first year we'll be back in person and that selection is happening in schools now. Each school can nominate one candidate and then the county selection will occur before the end of the month. Mock trial is gearing up um, and it looks like at this point, every school, every high school um, and FCPS will have a mock trial team. I haven't heard any different, um, but all should have a mock trial team. National History Day, um, we'll all, oh, I'm sorry, Model UN. We had Model UN um, orientation. 123 students participated in orientation on Saturday, um, and were literally running down the hallway when their number was called to uh, so they could get the committee they wanted and the country they wanted. Um, so very exciting news there. And then we have 162 already registered for our January 28th model UN, which we had held at Frederick High School. Let's see. Uh, National History Day uh, will be held in March, and we have a new partner in National History Day, and that's going to be Amanda Venable as our local coordinator, who is the director of Rose Hill Manor and a former social studies teacher in Frederick County. Um, so she is also partnered with us on um, making Rose Hill more accessible for our students. Um, so we're really looking forward to actually formalizing that partnership with Rose Hill um, to enrich the education of our students in the district. And then student member of the board elections, finally, and I'll shut up. Um, applications will be out before the end of the month, and then candidates uh, moving forward to the general election will be selected. In the Questions? Yeah, um, I know we're coming up for Mr. Jay's hard stop. In fact, I think he's extended it somehow. Um, I'm going to jump to Mr. J. Uh, thank you so much. I want to thank you, Colleen, for, for sharing. Uh, just a lot of great information. I want to say um, I'm grateful for your diligence and patience for reviewing those uh, concepts and topics as you're updating standards. I would like to take time to put quality and focus into making sure that um, content comes out really, really well. Uh, that it came through. 
I also wanted to thank you for your um, diligence in making sure we have equity in those courses. I know we formed that facilities course. You um, got creative and innovative to make sure people had opportunities to receive that. Um, also, I just want to thank you for uh, honestly for your support of the SMOPs. Um, I've worked with Mia, I've worked with Sam, I've worked with Lucas. They are phenomenal students. And just as the businesses, it's important to build up the business, bring them forward. Um, it's amazing. So, we just have amazing students you're working with. And so, what you're going to do and support them to bring them to, bring them to the board, they just, they're just great, great students. Some of them actually, like, you know, they could just be board members in their own right. So, not have to student board members, it's just a, a board member in their own right. So, great leadership coming through uh, CPS. You can be able to just uh, contribute to your work. And thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. If anyone who put me here is just lots of kudos, congratulations, and thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's really having a hard time here. Yes. Okay, uh, Ms. Yeho? Oh, I, I chime in. Uh, Ms. Bernard knows that this day, I hope, knows uh, I uh, love social studies, I uh, love history, I love everything they do. And I just uh, got to speak with some of the, the SMOPs uh, that came to MAVE. Uh, conference, the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, and the one from Baltimore County made a very strong argument. Uh, nobody's pushing her around, and she made a very strong argument for student voting rights. So uh, um, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. J that they are impressive people. I know I would say repeatedly, you know, let alone middle school. By the end of high school, I still didn't know what I was doing, and these students are already like preparing for this. So. They are very impressive people and, and wonderful to work with. Um, so again, thank you for everything. And, I, and I'm looking forward to Veterans Day um, celebration. It's always lovely. And um, you know, just always, you're very good about making sure we get invitations. And I do appreciate and enjoy attending those things. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just echo kudos and thank yous and uh, just wonderful programming for our students. and. Um, uh, just let the board know how you know there are additional ways that we can help support the good work being done. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, if there's no objection, we're going to move the standards that were listed today for approval to the full board at the not not the next board meeting, but at the, the next board meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. so, thank you. Great. We can uh, we can move those forward. All right. Thank you very much, team. Appreciate it. Enjoy thank your you afternoon. Everybody. Changing of the guard here. I think the mouse is all the way down. It is right. all the way down here. So I don't know if who's in charge of the mouse. Here. <laughs> Who do you want to control the slide for? I think Chris is going to. Look at that. Here I am. Dr. Better, you pass the mouse. Oh, there we go. At least I have to the top too. So yeah. You get somebody. So good morning, Ms. Johnson, Mr. J, if you're still there, Ms. Yoho, great to see you on the screen. Um, okay, um, and Dr. Kappa and distinguished committee members, we're really excited to be here this morning. Um, we're here to talk about the blended virtual programs, K through 12 or 1 through 12. And really the rock stars of this show are the three principals. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Kristen Canning, um, elementary director, Tom Saunders, middle school director, I don't know if the... Kate, you want to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Kreitz. I am the principal at the Blended Virtual Program for students in grades first through fifth. Good morning, Frank Fetter, principal of the Middle School Blended Virtual Program. I'm Mike Watson, principal of Frederick County Virtual School, who also oversees the high school. Program. So we're here to give you an overview of the second year 
uh, a virtual program being in place. Well, Mike has been part of the leadership of our virtual programs or our school for multiple years. Um, one of the pearls of the pandemic was the blended virtual program that came out for uh, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, so just really quickly, we serve students in elementary, middle, and high school. And this is the second year the BBPs have been fully uh, up and running. Students are instructing the FCPS curriculum in a virtual synchronous setting that includes asynchronous opportunities. Students attend live classes daily, Monday through Friday, and students remain enrolled in their home schools so that they can participate in most extracurricular activities. We provided some data um, for us to look at, and not surprising, we saw a drop in enrollment this year because a lot of times the BVP last year was a response to parents who were looking for an alternative educational setting because they were worried about the mask mandates and other things that were going on. I feel like we're getting to an equilibrium and we've identified a profile of a student that is really benefiting from this program, but you know, only time will tell as we move forward. But as you can see, elementary had the greatest drop, um, but we have 136 students. The middle school is still a, a drop, but 170 students. And the high school, 266, and had the least amount of drop um, in enrollment. I think what we'd like to highlight in the next slide is this is our current enrollment. So these are students who are currently enrolled in the BVP program this year. And it really is representing the diversity of Frederick County. It is really impressive. I think Frank's going to talk a little bit about that later on in his presentation. But um, if you look at all the categories, it really is well represented. So we're excited that this is accessible by many students. The next thing is the attendance rate from last year. The BVP students consistently performed above the county average, um, which is great news. And then if you look at the grades, um, which is uh, a comparison of at least one F in a course, we'll see that the BVP program is actually a higher number of students who receive one F. And I'll leave that to my colleagues at the BVP programs at the secondary level, but we are believing that this program doesn't fit all students. And we do believe that that is an indication of that. And as a result, we think this year the profile, like I said, is a little bit more fine tuned. Anticipate that probably reducing. And without further ado, I'm going to go to my friend, Mrs. Canning. Sure thing. So, um, again, I'm Kristen Canning. I'm the director from elementary that supports the EBDP program. And so I'm going to actually pass it along in a moment to have our, our principal share some celebrations. But I can say that I had the opportunity yesterday um, to be in some BVP elementary classrooms popping through. And it's striking the growth and the difference in um, the comfort of students in the program, the um, capacity of teachers to engage students. And so some of the celebrations that we're going to share are data from end of year surveys last year. I anticipate seeing um, some really exciting comments just as our program continues to grow and refine. So Kate, I, I'll let you go ahead and share some of this entry. Sure, um, Kristen was right. She got to visit yesterday. Um, she got to see teachers in action, students in action. Um, every class we went in, cameras were on, hands were up, students were engaged. Um, we were doing a small group model of our spark block. So each student was placed in a group based on their needs. So we definitely are doing some um, need-based grouping with our students. So again, Kristen said these are some celebrations from our perceptual survey in the spring. Um, these are two different parents um, that took the survey and shared the celebration with um, our team. So they just wanted to thank us. Uh, they love the BVP. It's a huge improvement over the experience at the home school. Both student and parent experiences have improved greatly. And this parent um, is pretty vocal and is wanting to make sure that the EBVP remains an option available for her child. The other um, celebration, um, this was specific data from the survey, um, students report and staff report that they agree or strongly agree 
The students are saying they're proud of their school. Our average was a little bit higher than all elementary school averages in the county. Um, in their school, the student felt like students of race, cultures, religions, and genders are treated fairly. Every student in our program either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. And as Kristen mentioned, in our demographics, we are very diverse in our student population. So it's great to see that all of our children do feel a part of our program um, and do feel like they're treated fairly. And then 100% of our staff also feel um, that they're proud of our school. And um, just an interesting um, caveat to our staffing, it was challenging last um, August to fill those last two positions for our program. Teachers weren't sure what they were getting into, what was the program gonna look like. We have had numerous teachers reach out over the course of the year asking, when are you gonna have an opening? I wanna come and teach at EBVP. So the pendulum has definitely switched um, with our staff in Frederick County. Um, we had a little bit of a struggle filling those last positions. Now, I think if we opened it up, we'd have people knocking at the door to come to want to teach at the elementary blended virtual program. So again, Frank Better, principal of the middle school blended virtual program. I think when uh, at its inception, one of our immediate concerns was how are we going to build community? How are we going to cultivate connection among students, among families, among staff? And so we really made that an important priority. And I think our data from last year in the survey reflects that the great job that my team did in really just cultivated community. Um, I am proud of my school, 89.1%, significantly higher than the county average. In my school, students of all races, cultures, religions, and genders are treated fairly. Again, significantly higher than the county average. And if you look at the diversity of our program, um, over 50% of our students are, are um, Actually, 41% of our students identify as white. So significant number of students identify as not white. Um, free and reduced meal students is about 44%, ranks us in the top quartile in terms of um, economic need. 20% of our students are GT, but 20% of our students are also special education students. Probably double the county average right there. So it's great that we've been able to bring so many different students together, so many different family needs, and, and, and create opportunity for them. And really, we see that as, as our emerging mission as, as a program, is creating opportunities for every student. But also, academics is important to me. I am challenged in my classes, and uh, I think it's at 89%. So. But if I could just read a couple of quotes here, too, just, uh, you know, I can't put names on, on some of these numbers here, but I think some of these quotes are really pretty fascinating. I, um, I was made privy to a, a support group that we had during one of our power blocks, which is an afternoon office hours and, and um, tutoring sessions that we hold. And a special education teacher was leading a small group of students, and these are some of the comments from kids. One student said, when I first started, my anxiety was so high, I hated school. I love school again. <coughs> I love coming every day and working with all my teachers. My teachers make me feel safe. Another student said, I know people care. Then um, all the students just said how great they feel about school. And finally, one student said, I can just be myself and feel confident. So again, really, really proud of the great work that So again, Mike Watson, principal for the County Virtual School. Uh, you can see our data very similar to the middle school as far as the social emotional learning survey. I think it's you know important those bullets show that students do feel comfortable in this learning environment. And I think the one that's probably most meaningful for me is that they feel challenged in their classes and that the level of rigor, I think, compares to that of a traditional school classroom. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see some of the celebrations um, that we've made some changes this year is in addition to blended virtual program courses, our students do have access to the other programs through Frederick County Virtual School, which are um, different model, uh, much more asynchronous opportunities, allow students to control the time and place when they're accessing the content, but it also allows them to control the pace at which they go through the course. And so we certainly have students who sometimes um, take courses through those programs, they can finish them early, it provides some flexibility to their schedule so they can pursue some other options possibly during the school day as well. 
This year, we increased our course offerings to try to offer a more well-rounded um, <coughs> high school experience compared to our traditional schools. And while that helped in kind of providing kids a lot of different options for coursework and filling out their schedule, we might have overreached. I think we're going to have to probably narrow some of our course offerings based on enrollment, based on staffing, um, to kind of mainstream, like this is the path we would really have you go through for a virtual um, environment. And I think we'll have to do some communicating with families and students as we go through the enrollment and registration process as well. Then the other um, celebration is we implemented a new daily schedule, and this was really driven by our students last year. They did not think that a traditional school day from 7.30 to 2.15 on Google Meets was ideal for their learning styles. And so they advocated for more asynchronous opportunities. So we developed a schedule where students are receiving asynchronous, or excuse me, synchronous instruction from 8 o'clock, so a little bit later high school start time, um, to 12.15, so that's four blocks, an hour each of synchronous instruction. And then the second half of the day, they have asynchronous opportunities but we also built in support because of some of that data we saw a little bit earlier, where 18% of students were earning an F in some of their courses. You really got to dive into who those students are to identify what the cause is um, for that, because you could certainly have four students who have an F in every course representing a large percentage of those students. But we wanted to provide support for students who might be struggling in this environment. How can we get them more access to one-on-one -on -one support with the teacher, special ed support, um, and other ways that we can support families and kind of students who might be struggling, especially if it's their first time trying to learn in this environment, um, because it's a little bit different than what we were doing during our COVID um, emergency remote learning. Uh, so really proud of that. And then I'll share some quotes from some students who kind of capitalized on the idea of asynchronous instruction and driving that decision. So if you go to the next slide, Crystal. You can see here's one of our seniors, Alana, who really kind of enjoys this asynchronous opportunities, gives her that one-on-one -on -one time support with teachers, but also allows her to pursue some extra Spanish tutoring um, because of that schedule. And I think that's where we really have to try to capitalize on virtual instruction moving forward, at least at the high school level. Um, students are demanding alternative schedules to meet their graduation requirements, and I think we have a responsibility to kind of respond to that need. The next slide was someone who didn't want to share their name, um, but again, reemphasizing the independent nature of it, the flexibility of scheduling and working at their own pace. And this historically, even with the other programs that we offer, we've always completed a student survey at the completion of a course. And that's, you know, 80% of the times, the reason students are taking courses virtually is because they want flexibility and control um, at the high school level. And so I think we need to kind of look at some other ways that we can capitalize on that. The other thing, the last thing I'd like to say, just kind of when, you know, looking at numbers um, and, you know, trying to determine staffing, you know, so our enrollment is down, but at the same time, we have at the high school 46 students who are currently on a wait list. So we have students who still want to enroll in this program, but because of staffing scheduling, we made a decision that you could, all, like, the on ramps are the beginning of the school year and at the semester change. And so at the semester change, we'll be evaluating. Um, students who are currently enrolled and maybe making some recommendations for them to return to their home school if this isn't working, or we'll be providing some students on a wait list additional opportunity to come to the blended virtual program. Great. Right. So while we always celebrate and take some time to notice what's going really well, we're also in a, in a cycle of continuous improvement always. And so as a program, as we think and plan for next steps to provide um, the best support to students access and the highest quality experience. We have some next steps that we're working through. The first is about um, the, the middle and high school and including those options for blended virtual in that course catalog. Um, we talked a lot about, and you've heard us speak to the, the shift in the virtual program. Um, it was by necessity a response to the pandemic when we first began, but really what it is in its um, truest form, it's an alternate model for students who really thrive in that environment. So the um, consideration of an application process for the next school year is one that we'll work through together just so that we can make certain that anybody who's exploring this as an option comes in completely aware of what, of what this program offers, what the expectations are, and that we can know a little bit about students and their learning styles to help us 
um, make certain that we meet all students' needs. Um, because of the numbers that we looked at today, the enrollment as it sits now, we're confident that we can um, administrate this program with one administrator for a one through eight model. So right now we, we started with a, um, an elementary administrator and a middle school administrator. Extremely important as we built the program and as we created um, the opportunity, now as we look on refining, we think that next year our proposal will move us into looking at more one to eight program. We're interested to see what the numbers continue to look like moving forward. And um, as always, we'll be flexibly ready to respond. And that brings us to the next point. Just like in our brick and mortar buildings, we're always refining our staffing allocations based upon enrollment, based upon um, other factors. And in our BVP, it really is about who is uh, who's applying to come and how many staff do we need in each our middle, um, elementary, middle, and high programs to make certain that we can provide a comprehensive experience. And then we have the luxury, and it really has been a luxury, and you spoke to it about really listening to your students and being able to change, Mike, at the, at the high school level. We want to continue to explore innovative models. You know, the opportunities are endless for us as we gain comfort in the current setting, as we learn more about what works in, um, in other places for our staff and for our students. So we're excited about the continuation of um, exploring some innovative learning models that, that may allow our students to be even more successful. And then as always, we remain agile to all of the guidance that we receive from MSDE as it relates to virtual instruction and, um, and adjust accordingly. So with that, we will move to questions or discussion. Ms. Yarrow? Thank you. Um, I now have people making lunch, so sorry. Um, I just want to thank everybody. It's very strange to hear disembodied voices, so I think I'm able to put uh, faces to voices. But uh, I just want to thank everybody for um, just your willingness to analyze and to uh, be flexible. Um, you know, always, and, and we've had you know what now ten years, I think, of the virtual high school. Um, we're always trying to be responsive to students and do the best you can. And I truly appreciate, I think, the parents and the students that take advantage of the program. Um, from what I've seen in emails, they do truly appreciate having that um, opportunity. So thank you for being able to provide that for our students. Um, I thank you so much for all your work in it. This is what resonates with me is the amount of energy spent on uh, focusing on what our students need and, and your responsiveness to that. And so um, I know sometimes we can come up with a framework and we want the students to fit the framework, but I think we're trying to develop the framework around what the students need and want. And that's, uh, that takes a lot, a lot of effort to do that. So I, I personally uh, appreciate that so much. Um, I would like to continue to see us offering this uh, um, mode of instruction for our students and, and appreciate the full comments about uh, continuing to refine what our needs are on there. I, I know um, it's interesting how you can apply your analytics on the composition of the student base, um, why they're there, um, and, and I think that that's something we really need to stay on top of because that will help dictate the programming. Uh, opportunities for them. So, so I appreciate hearing what I've heard um, because I think that that's like the, the right direction to go into. Um, I don't know how you're going to solve that that more polar grade distribution. Um, and I just think just diving into you know individual students, you know, what 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 is the reasoning for them? Because I'm sure it's not just uh, an intellectual ability, but there's going to be some Kind of barriers there and, and trying to figure that out but that's been enough you know we've been trying to crack for a long time that you know at FCC and and so I thank you for your effort in trying to figure out um you know Ms. Walker was saying about like this book like you might have one student who's failing like, all their classes there's got to be more going on in, in that situation so as long as we have the, the channels of communication there between the students and their families and our other support staff um, to help make sure that 
we know what's going on so that we can be as responsible as possible. So I just, you know, part one by the work that goes on and the dedication of our staff uh, for, for our students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think we're the next item on the agenda. Thank you again. Um, the next item on the agenda, I guess, while there's still people in the room, I'm masking up to the coming out of COVID and then like day 14. That's why I was out at the board meeting two weeks ago. That was like the day that I was participating in school health council meeting virtually. And I thought, how am I going to get through this meeting? And then I went, after that <laughs> meeting, I went to bed and then I woke up around two and I called Brad and I said, I'm not going to make it. And I think it's my colleagues here know I'm, I'm, I'm a reliable attendee yeah, at our meetings. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. I had to, and they all said, you have to be feeling bad for you to have to come. But I didn't know for almost a week. Because I just assumed I was just tired. Because I didn't have a rest before. So anyhow, that's why I'm messed up. I'm on like day 14. And it came through the household. So quickly. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I could feel feeling better. Yeah, oh, I, yeah, I am. And, uh, and, uh, it's caught me by surprise. Two and a half years we've been able to like escape it and then boom. It it knocked on the door and came in the house. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is uh uh virtual uh, to the future agenda topics. And so I think we have November. We'll just discuss in December and Yeah, so we, we did have some requests for some adjustments to the schedule. Um, we do need to add a dental course presentation. Uh, during the month of November, it's time sensitive related to grants, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, that would put four um, topics on for November 9th. We probably could get through there, but um, those topics, uh, middle school courses update is going to probably result in some significant conversation. Advanced academics will as well. And I'm wondering if it might make sense to do English language arts from November to December and then move science from December to January to free that up. Mm -hmm. So if the board's okay with that, we can make those changes. Is and there any reason to just not let have English go in January and leave the December schedule with it? Uh, it's probably easier to bump them in stagger because okay. of the way they pre prepare their presentations. Okay. I think science just got their materials this week, so we can have them hold in the way. Mm -hmm. ELA is probably close to being completed for their presentation, so we'll just move them to December. Okay. And then um, <clears throat> December 7th, we have here a possible start time of 9 a.m. because that's the DOE swearing in date. Ms. Rich is inquiring and asking if we could do it 8.30 to 10.30 so there's adequate time to switch the room over from this configuration to the swearing in. Does that mm -hmm. sound okay for you all? It does for me, Ms. Yaho. <laughs> Well, you know, that will all depend on the election. <laughs> it depends on the election. Well, you're, regardless of the election, you would still participate in the not on Not on that day unless I'm reelected. So uh, the November meeting I will be at for sure, and that that is fine. Okay. So, so we're all just at the 8.30 to 10.30 and uh, get a communication out to Mr. J. So we can yes. have a little on that. Uh, we appreciate the flexibility of the schedule. Okay. So we have. Any other comments? Any further? Any public comment? Okay. Well, with that, we adjourn. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you.